Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So in a request from the comment section, I was asked to do a video on OB anesthesia or obstetric anesthesia and um, show you guys what a day is like when you're an anesthesiologist taking care of patients on labor and delivery. So today's that day. So let's come along with me and let's check it out. So when you're doing obstetric anesthesia, you're basically a person of great value to the labor and delivery floor. Um, so you're going to be, most importantly, being the person that they call if there's any emergencies with a laboring patient, if there's any stat situations, and there are so many that can come up when women are in labor in the hospital. And also, of course, as you all may know, you're going to be the one they call if anyone is in need of any labor analgesia. And what that is, is you're going to be providing pain medicine for women going through labor. So that part, providing the labor analgesia, is probably going to be the most busy part of my day today. So what I'll be doing is, as needed, um, I'll be placing epidurals and for our schedule C sections, I'll be placing spinals. They are different. So most people don't really know the difference between the two of those techniques. And today I will show you what they are. So let's get into the first part of my day, which is checking in on the patient list to make sure I know who's on the floor, who is in the labor um, and delivery unit, that is, and what is going on with them. What is their medical background? What is um, some of the things that is going on that might be concerning for me and that I would need to be prepared for should there be an emergency that comes up with the patient. So let's go. checking on my patients and I just want to go through with you guys what makes up an epidural. So an epidural is basically an injection of local anesthesia and or the placement of a catheter that will deliver local anesthesia plus other medications sometimes um, but primarily local anesthesia into the epidural space which is a potential space. So the anatomy of the spine is such that you have different layers. Um, you have, starting with the most superficial, skin, then you have subcutaneous fat, and then after that, usually when you're in the orientation that you're gonna be placing an epidural in, you're gonna encounter ligament, which is the ligament that connects the spinous processes together. And then after you get through that ligament, that is interspinous ligament, and then after that, you're going to encounter the ligamentum flavum, which is the last barrier before you can reach your epidural space. And that is really important for anesthesiologists because we use that barrier and the feel of passing through that barrier as our way to know when, when we have exactly entered the epidural space. So we use what we call a loss of resistance technique. So we'll take a needle. And this is our teaching epidural kit. Take a needle, much like this. It's huge, right? <laughs> this is what we call a tui needle because there are wings on it. And those wings are very helpful for us to actually use to control and guide this needle um, exactly the way we want it to go. It's usually small movements, you know, we go millimeter by millimeter. And what we're doing is feeling for a loss of resistance, as I mentioned. So as we're going through that ligament, we will do what we call a check for the loss of resistance with a syringe that is very easily going to give us feedback. It gives us feedback very nicely because it's um, low friction and it's usually made of glass. So that's this kind of syringe is a loss of resistance syringe. And what we do is we put it on the end of our needle like so. And then as we're feeling the patient's stack and we're going for the spaces in between the bones, we're going to be checking for resistance. So we're going to be giving little bits of air as we go. And usually when we get to the place where we're in the epidural space, we won't have any resistance whatsoever because it's a space and there's nothing blocking the air passage. That's how we know where we are. So the patient doesn't see any of this, thankfully. 
they are very much, you know, probably focused on trying to be still and trying not to uh, respond to any contraction pains that may be going on. So we do this process pretty quickly, but it's blind, so we don't really see where the tip of the needle is. It's a feel. So that's why it's really important for patients not to move and to give us verbal feedback if anything is uncomfortable because you might be off of the midline path that we're trying to go in. So once we're in that potential space, we'll actually pass this really small catheter through the epidural needle. And that is going to end up in the epidural space with the patient in the back. So we actually thread it through nice and slow. And that's that. And usually we'll take note of where we found the loss of resistance. And then we leave the catheter in a depth past that to make sure that we still have catheter in the space once we pull our needle back. So usually your anesthesiologist is paying close attention to all of this and they will be able to guesstimate how deep this catheter needs to go in. So the catheter is left in, the needle is taken out, epidural in, and then we can give drugs on this end of it. And most of the time, we'll attach a little end piece, a business end, a little end piece, close it. And then on the other end of that, we can start giving whatever you want to fill the syringe with as far as local anesthesia goes, that's appropriate. <laughs> We won't get into that in this video, but usually it's some family of the lidocaine class of drugs. We don't typically give lidocaine in the epidural or in the spinal injection because it can cause irritation to the nerves and also can cause like a pretty bad syndrome associated with nerve damage. So what we usually do is we give other local anesthetics that are less likely to be irritating to the nerves. We usually end with the suffix cane, and this is what we give. So we usually inject and it goes into the patient's epidural space. That space is where all of the spinal nerves live. And so they get numbed up and then people don't feel pain or their pain is much less, less severe. So that's the goal of epidural. So a spinal is different than epidural in that instead of stopping at the epidural space, which is right before the dura, so epidural, so right before the dura, we actually continue on past that space with a very small needle we actually make a small hole in the dura, which surrounds your spinal cord. So remember your spinal cord is the most important part of your central nervous system that will help you to move your limbs, etc. So we use a very teeny tiny needle for spinals. It looks much thinner than the last one, right? So this is a spinal needle compared to this big whopper epidural needle. So don't, so notice that it's epidural needles at the bottom, spinals at the top. So notice that the Final needle is much longer because again, you need to go a little bit further in. So this will help you to get that depth of your needle to get to the space you need to be in. And then you can inject your medication through that. So this guy is your spinal needle. So this is what we'll end up using for a spinal injection. A lot of times we'll actually put it through an epidural needle. So you'll get your epidural, you will lose resistance. And then after you take off your syringe, you're gonna put your spinal needle through the epidural needle. This is what we call a combined spinal epidural technique. And once you get through there, you should be in the space where your spinal cord is and the fluid around the spinal cord, cerebral spinal fluid, is what you need to get back out of this. So we'll take out our little blocker, our stylet. Usually you see little drops of cerebral spinal fluid and then we're like, yes, we hit the gold. So we know we're exactly where we wanna be. And so then after that, we'll give our injection of local anesthesia. It's usually a very small amount that's required once you get to the spinal column and we'll give our dose. Boom, blocked. So that's a really great way to get rid of any type of painful input from the areas that are affected during labor. So here I am teaching you guys and getting a pain. Those needles down. <laughs> All right, so we have a patient coming in that we need to go see, so let's go. just to check and make sure everything is ready for the day. So we usually have, even though we use our regional techniques of spinal and epidurals, we usually have prepared and ready to go uh, intubation supplies. So just in case we have any issues with our spinal or epidural, the backup plan is always general anesthesia, which includes an intubation. So we have several breathing tubes available, different sizes that would be appropriate for laboring 
adult woman um, and our other supplies, suction, the mask, of course, that we're gonna put on the patient before and other airway devices that will help us to mask ventilate if we need to and keep our patient safe. So all of those things are always ready to go in our OR. This is the OR table where they will be having a stat or emergent C-section. So that's the usual case for coming to the OR. And for the patients that are coming in for scheduled C-sections, we have spinal trays that are ready to go or combined spinal epidural trays. So those are kits that have all those different pieces of equipment that I showed you before. So the name of the game on OB is to be prepared. And you always wanna be completely ready for any scenario that might come up as an anesthesiologist on OB. So depending on what type of surgery you work at, you'll be doing OB anesthesia pretty most often on call. Um, and you can also primarily do OB anesthesia during your day if you are at a center where there's high volume and you have a preference for the area or um, even have a fellowship training, which is available for anesthesia residency graduates. You can do one year of OB fellowship after you're done with your four core years of anesthesia residency. So it's a really rewarding area of practice on a daily basis. So it provides a great opportunity for you to take care of people in their neediest times and feel very much rewarded for doing so. So with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.